Hello, and welcome to Opening Bars. The decades-long musical pairing of Elton John and lyricist Bernie Taupin has produced some of the most memorable and enduring songs of all time. Your song was one of their very earliest of collaborations. If the lyrics ring with naivete and innocence, I suppose it's because they are. In an interview with Music Connection in 1989, Bernie says, It's got to be one of the most naive and childish lyrics in the entire repertoire of music. But I think the reason it still stands up is because it was real at the time. That was exactly what I was feeling. I was 17 years old, and it was coming from someone whose outlook on love or experience with love was totally new and naive. I might also argue that Elton's recording captures this sentiment much more earnestly than does the slightly up-tempo, jazzy version that Three Dog Night released on their It Ain't Easy album of 1970. Anyway, what might be interesting to look at here is whether Elton's musical vocabulary of the time matches the same juvenile characteristics of the lyric or do we already see the seeds of something more? Let's begin with our harmonic analysis. We'll be using a piano grand staff with the treble and bass clefs for the right hand and left hand respectively, three flats in the key signature, and the common 4-4 four, four time for this example. The opening chord is a definitive E-flat major with the third doubled at the extremities, above an E-flat in the bass. So this is our tonic. We'll label that with a capital I in Roman numerals. Notice that the E-flat remains as a pedal point in the bass throughout these opening bars, while the right-hand chords move through an A-flat 4, a B-flat 5, and back to A flat, with a fleeting B flat underneath, which provides the briefest moment of my so called four dom, that is, a four chord over the dominant of the scale. Katie Marie Meyer, in her 2016 doctoral dissertation at the University of Iowa, entitled The Emotion in the Music of Elton John, notes, Elton John often uses chords a fourth apart. This is demonstrated clearly in songs such as Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, Your Song, and Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. The movement, one to four, in many instances over the one in the bass, is a very common feature of Elton's music, and is a key component of his sonic signature. In her data analysis, she also has some very interesting observations, and once again, I'll quote from her paper. Elton is most likely to create a hit song in the key of C major, G major, F major, or B flat major. Keys with very few accidentals, which make piano playing simple for someone who needs to be able to sing at the same time. The time signature is always 4-4, and the tempo is usually between 70 BPM and 90 BPM, a range of fairly slow tempi. The average track length for Elton's greatest hits is 4 minutes 37 seconds, relatively long for a chart hit. I'd make a note here, for the record, that your song is in E-flat major, 66 beats per minute in common time, and four minutes and two seconds long. But more to my earlier point, Elton's harmonic language does display some maturity in the verse and chorus. Just take a look at these screenshots captured from hooktheory.com. The cadences are pretty conventional in the verse and chorus, but you can also clearly see how he uses a rich palette of chords to get there. 
the tonic, of course, but also two, four, six, a lovely G minor seven to get to that C minor, which he only moments later turns into a secondary dominant to get to the same relative minor, and a fantastic sharp four dim seven, which ends up sliding down a semitone to the major four chord. That's cool. He also uses inversions of chords effectively to produce a variety of colorings and chromatic bassline voice leading, something we also saw in my video on Sorry Seems to Be the Hardest Word. I'd say, overall, he already has an innate sense of enriched harmony and where and how it can move beyond the common fare. Let's look at the rhythm. Starting with the bass, we see a quarter, dotted eighth, and sixteenth pattern repeated throughout the fragment. That's easy enough. Now, the right hand is almost identical in each measure. Here an eighth, two sixteenths, tied, to two sixteenths, landing on an eighth. In the second measure, the first eighth is expanded into two sixteenths, and the rest is the same. Just for fun, let's consider what this would sound like if the two bars were identical. Notice how it completely changes the balance of novelty and repetition. What I do find fascinating is a very subtle rhythmic fluctuation in how Elton moves in and out of the last two notes of the motif. It's different between measures. He seems to push beats two and four in measure one, but is more in the pocket in measure two. Let me try and exaggerate that for you so you can hear it. I'll push both measures similarly, then I'll relax both and then I'll perform them as he does on the album. I'll play all three versions, see if you can perceive the differences. Here it is, slightly pushed. And here it is more relaxed and in the pocket. And this is, more or less, how Elton plays it. If you need to go back and listen again, Elton is playing with the nuance of rhythmic repetition, something that is definitely a sign of an elevated and matured musicality. Now that you know the notes, you can concentrate on advancing specific piano techniques. One skill you can work on while practicing is to balance the sectional dynamics. So what do I mean by that? Well, we often talk about ensuring that our soft piano is distinct from our strong forte, or how we dynamically shape melodic lines, but how is a single dynamic marking carried through the entire section without it sounding too static? and at the same time, being musical. Well, we have four moments of harmony here, and no truly definitive melody to highlight, so it's a perfect opportunity to play with this idea. I'd say that the overall dynamic here is a mezzo forte. So what if we were to play all of the tones, both vertically and horizontally, at exactly the same dynamic velocity for every note and chord throughout both measures. Let me do that now, while still trying to maintain the rhythmic stylism. Have a listen. Oh 
okay, so what if I make the second half of measure one a stronger mezzo forte, measure two a moderately stronger mezzo forte, and the second half of measure two the lightest of the mezzo fortes? So I'm hoping we would agree that we would like something more nuanced, like my second plate example. And finally, here's an essential question to ponder. What does it mean to play musically? I mean, that's what this whole channel is about, really. Let's do this experiment. I'm going to play seven audio excerpts of the same four-bar opening segment, one of which is Elton John's original. Which one seems the most musical to you? This exercise is not about deriving a right answer to the question, but the more pertinent observation, why do you think your selection is any more musical than any other? What are the criteria upon which you are basing your opinion? Now that's a good question to ruminate upon. And in case you're interested in which sample is Elton's, the answer is in the description. Okay, put your ears on, and let's listen to all seven in a row. I hope you enjoyed your lesson today. Remember, don't just play notes. Make music. Until next time, thanks for listening.